Hello, friend. I'm releasing this episode number 12 of Joy Sightings at the Daily Bible Reading Podcast feed in order to let you know about my recordings of Tales of the Kingdom and Tales of the Restoration by David and Karen Maines. You can find the other chapters of these two books at joysightings.info. It was perhaps in 1989 that a precious friend sent the two books to us when we were living in the rainforest of Papua, Indonesia. Our children were at just the right ages to enjoy the full impact of these stories. It's a joy for me now to share these with you also. Each book consists of 12 chapters written as allegories. You'll enjoy the deep symbolic meanings that underlie the story of characters with names like Caretaker, Mercy, and Hero. At the joysightings.info site, the first chapter of Tales of the Kingdom is Episode 12, and the first chapter of Tales of the Resistance is Episode 25. When I made the podcast recordings, I was reading from the first edition of the two books of tales, published in 1983 and 1986 by David C. Cook. The books have beautiful color pictures, one per chapter, by Jack Stockman. I tried repeatedly to reach out to David C. Cook to ask for permission to share these recordings on my podcast. In 2019, I reached out to David and Karen Maines via their Facebook page, and David answered, giving his permission for my podcasts. Now, in 2023, I discovered that the copyright for the books now belongs to Mainstay Ministries. In February, I attempted to more formally reconfirm permission for my podcasts. However, I found that the Mainstay Ministries website is not currently working, and both the numbers given for contacting them have been disconnected. If any of you listeners can connect me with the Maines family, I would appreciate it very much. In the podcast notes, I've listed the two Mainstay Ministries websites that are currently not working, as I said. So now, I am happy to present the first chapter of Tales of the Kingdom by David and Karen Maines. Chapter 1. The Enchanted City Once upon a time, not long ago and not far away, there was a boy, no longer a child and not yet a man, who lived in the Enchanted City. The boy, Scar Boy, and his younger brother, Little Child, were not like the other children in the city. Yesterday their mother had died, and they had immediately been taken into the custody of the Enchanter's men. Rumors said that the Enchanter kept orphans to stoke the huge fires that burned deep in the holds of the Dagoda, the temple where the Enchanter lived and ruled. A burner one of the secret police who carried out the enchanter's bidding, had brought the boys to the burning place, a vast square of ashes. There they would watch the funeral ceremonies for their mother, whose body rested on an ornate bier, or coffin, in the middle of the field. The thought of his mother choked the older boy. She had been so beautiful, as beautiful as the daughter of a king. There is a king, his mother had always insisted. A real king. She believed the ancient tales, even though signs were posted all over Enchanted City. There is no such thing as a king, death to pretenders. But his mother had become ill, as so many did in the foul air of Enchanted City. In the last days before she died, she slipped in and out of the fever, often telling Scarboy the ancient tales from her childhood. She had said, Once a great king ruled our city. All the people thought him beautiful and served him willingly. But the enchanter came and deceived the people and put a spell on the city. The king was exiled. Those who would find him must hunt for him in the place where trees grow. 
Then the death drums interrupted the boy's memories. Um papa, um papa, um papa din. Now he heard the ceremonial bells sewn to the hem of the fire priest's robes. He heard the mourner's chants. Then a swish, an explosion. The funeral flames had been ignited. As the swirling swords of fire leaped toward the sky, a long line of shining cars, low and shadowy and quiet, moved toward the field and parked on the edge of Burning Place. The boy's heart pounded. The enchanter had come to the funeral ceremony. Scarboy watched the tall man step out into the field of ashes. The boy saw the amber hair that curled and caught the light of the blazing fire. A handsome man, most thought, but Scarboy's mother had said that the look in his eyes was cruel. The boy took little child's hand and held him close. The enchanter was wearing the robe of fire, a mastery of woven color, red and yellow patterns interwoven with orange and white and blue. Burners, each holding a glowing poker in their hands, climbed from the other cars. Soon the tall, proud man was surrounded by these guards. The Enchanter ruled Enchanted City with fire. He loved fire, loved its power. He called it to himself and used it to cast spells. Long ago he had decreed night to be day and day to be night, because he was so jealous of the light of the sun. Now the people of Enchanted City rose from their beds to work and play and eat when the moon, a lesser light, came up. They went to sleep at dawn. Mothers tucked their children beneath the covers and said, "'Morning, morning, see you in the night.' The enchanter turned and looked across the ash field at the two boys as the death drums beat his personal rhythm. Din, din, din. "'Are these the orphans?' he called, pointing at them. A burner nodded. With quick long strides, the tall man covered the field between them. Burners marched behind the enchanter in formation. Each held high a poker, which was now smoldering with hot power. Scar Boy covered his cheek with his hand. The enchanter faced the boys. The man's eyes widened, then narrowed. Suddenly, the enchanter reached down and removed Scar Boy's hand from his cheek. Then the ruler lifted the boy's chin. "'What is that on your face?' Why were you not cast out of the city? The boy squirmed. He wanted to scream for fear. He wanted to kick and run. The man's touch was hot. He struggled to keep calm. It, it's not a disease, sire, nor was I born with defect. An accident, an accident at branding. It was the truth. It had happened a long time ago, when he was only five, according to the custom Burners had taken all the children of Enchanted City who were his age to brand their hands with a hot poker. "'You are signed with the mark of the Enchanter,' the men had cried. "'Never forget that you belong to the keep of the great Burner.' The boy had screamed, bitten, and kicked. In the struggle, the cruel brand had fallen, either by accident or on purpose, on his cheek. He would bear the scar the rest of his life.' People always looked at him and gasped. They turned their eyes away. Children pointed and shouted, Scar boy! Hey you, Scar boy! Soon he had learned to cover his face with his hand. Now Scar boy remembered his mother's final words. Take little child and escape. Escape before branding time. Before little child turns five. Escape before the enchanter comes. But it was too late. The enchanter held the boy's chin with a vice-like grip. The man bent close, and the boy shuddered at the waves of heat. The enchanter whispered, "'Your mother foolishly believed in kings.' "'How did he know that?' Scarboy wondered. He noticed that the burner's pokers flashed a sudden hot red at the words. The enchanter's lips smiled kindly, but his eyes were all malice. "'And what does her son, her orphan son, believe?' The boy pulled his chin out of the man's clutch. He covered his cheek again with his hand. He cast his eyes to the ground. I have never seen a king, sire, only an enchanter. The cruel eyes narrowed even more. Seeing is believing. See that you keep it so, orphan. Keep it so. With that, the great burner turned on his heel. The guards marched beside, and the drums paced. Din, din, din. Then they were gone. 
Scarboy's lungs screamed for cool air. His heart timed, escape, escape, escape. He would rather die than be a slave of the enchanter. But it was too late for such thoughts. Scarboy felt a strong hand on his elbow. The butt end of an iron poker was shoved into his side by the burner, whose eyes were hollows of darkness, empty even in the dancing light of the reflected flames. Come, he said, to the orphan keeper with you. The three moved away from the burning place, down little streets past narrow buildings. Night lights stood on poles and lit the way. Day was far off. When they came to the marketplace, Scarboy could see the jumbles of bins and awnings, could hear haggling and barter. The burner had released his hold, but it didn't matter. His hard poker still jabbed Scarboy's side, and the boy knew he could never outrun his captor. Little child whimpered, and Scarboy lifted him up. Suddenly, the power failed. Lights out! Lights out! people cried. Power outs were frequent, but at this precise moment it seemed a miracle. The enchanted city needed man-made power to live by and to light the night. Everything ran on energy from furnaces beneath the city, which were stoked with fuel. Buses and cars and buildings were attached to the underground cables. But the fuel supply was always running low. The man-made power was always failing. In power outs, traffic stopped. Homes and places of business became dark. The clocks ran off time, on time, in between time. Even play didn't work. Sometimes the lights failed right in the middle of the ninth inning, just when they were needed most. But Scarboy knew this power out was his chance to escape. He bolted away from the burner, carrying Little Child safely in his arms. Runaways! Runaways! the burner shouted. But no one heard him in the confusion. Horns blared, push carts banged against each other, vendors yelled, Hey, get that thief! Hands off my stuff! as vagrants took advantage of the power failure to acquire food. Everyone screamed, Lights! Lights! Amid all this din, Scarboy made a successful getaway. He ran with his little brother in his arms, ran until his heart felt like bursting. When the power came back on, Scarboy stopped his frantic running. He had lost his way, and he knew that soon the burners would come looking for them. The enchanter would not be cheated out of what he owned. Fortunately, dawn was coming. All would obey the edict, sleep in the light, except the burners who would keep on hunting, even though the bright light hurt their eyes. If only Scarboy could stay awake and hide until he found the way out. But what was the way out? Could it be that there was a king, as his mother had said? Would it ever be possible to find the place where this king lived? Scarboy crept into a hole beneath the porch steps of a nearby house so he could buy time to think. His mother had said, It's not dark in the place where trees grow. But there were no trees in the city because all had been chopped for fuel. Scarboy knew trees grew in forests. He had heard there was a forest somewhere outside the city. If only he knew the way. A time man walked by, crying the hour. Two more hours before day. Suddenly Scarboy heard the drums. They beat loud and angry. Mmm, papa! Mmm, papa! Mmm, papa! -pa. The boy knew they were drumming about him. There was no safety now, no hiding place. Every shadow could hold a burner. The boy found a little money in his pocket. He had heard that taxi drivers could get you where you needed to go if anyone could. But would a taxi be safe? Surely taxi drivers knew the message of the drumbeats. Scarboy had to take a chance. He grabbed his brother's hand, carefully looked up and down the street, and hailed a cab. He asked the driver as the cab pulled up to the curb, Can you get us to the end of the city where the forest is? The driver looked the two boys over with shrewd eyes. Sure, sure, he said, but hurry, curfew's coming. Pay in advance, refund only in case of power failure. Scarboy took a deep breath, and the boys climbed in. The taxi driver set his meter and connected the power. Screeching through little traveled streets, he made his way quickly to a huge garbage dump on the edge of the city. Scarboy had never been there. End of the line, the man said urgently. Passengers out. 
Scarboy felt hesitant. Is this near where the trees grow? The driver leaned over the seat and opened the back door. The line only goes this far. This here's the dump. Then he winked an eye and said, If you look hard enough, you'll find where the trees grow. The boys climbed out, and as the cab sped away, Scarboy thought he heard the man shout, To the king! The phrase echoed through Scarboy's mind, but he had little time to wonder about the cab driver's strange farewell, for the familiar sound of the drums, mm pa 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 mm pa 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 interrupted his thoughts and forced him to look around for a safe hiding place, or better yet, the beginning of a forest. Little child began to cough and whine. Hush, Scarboy whispered. The two boys sat on the cinder road. A gray line of light split the sky above the world. Little child fell asleep, but Scarboy waited for day to come. He listened to the distant drums. Something is wrong here, Scarboy thought. Suddenly he realized that the shadows were moving. Scarboy was sure he had seen a distant gray form move toward him. That one there, and that one. The gray in the sky spread. He could see by its light. Over the hills of garbage, men were creeping toward him. Burners, thought Scarboy. Without a word, they crept silently closer. One there, another there. The boy bent and lifted his sleeping brother. His knees were weak with fear. He was surrounded on three sides by the advancing menace. He could see them more clearly as the sky began to brighten. The message drums were sounding far off from within the city, but they were beating faster and faster and faster. Quickly, Scarboy stood erect and faced the shadows. He had not come this far to give up now. He balanced Little Child in one arm and waved the blade of his pocket knife defiantly with the other hand. He shouted, No! I will not be your man. If there is a king, I will find him. If there is a way, I will hunt it out. I will fight you to the last. At that moment, day broke behind the boy. The sky flushed pink, then warmed to rose. The burners paused. Their eyes could not bear the bright light. Scarboy heard a strange and musical humming, which seemed to come from the other side of an old gate he had not noticed on the edge of the garbage dump. The burners stopped, shielded their eyes, and looked up at the ever-brightening sun. In that minute of advantage, Scarboy turned and ran. He raced with Little Child in his arms toward the old closed gate away from the enchanter's stunned henchmen. Wild weeds grew around the stone gate posts. The wrought iron latch was rusted. Breathless, the boy stopped and rattled the gate. Just then the sun blazed radiant above them, and the gate began to creak slowly open. Waiting impatiently for entrance, the boy glanced up at the arch. Words were chiseled in the old moss-covered stones. Welcome, all who hunt. Scarboy squeezed himself and his brother into the ever-widening entrance. He was breathless. Little child was heavy. How could he close the gate? And where could he hide next? You called? asked a voice from behind him. The boy whirled to face the funniest-looking man he had ever seen. The creature was tall and wore a small tree on his head for a hat. His clothes were the color of green and brown and gray. A giant set of keys dangled from a vine which circled his waist. He had long white hair and a long white beard, and both of them were tucked into his belt. His coat had pockets, and his vest had pockets, and his pants had pockets, all filled with pruning shears and scissors and trowels. The man was holding a hatchet, carved with strange markings, in front of his face. Slowly he lifted it with both hands above his head, and Scarboy noticed that the musical hum was coming from the hatchet. The gate slammed shut. The drums outside stopped beating. All was quiet. Scarboy was aware of only one sound. Chirp! Chirp! What was that? A bird singing? The sound fit his mother's description, but he had never heard its melody before, since there were no wild things in Enchanted City. He looked down at his brother in his arms. Little child was as quiet as if he were in a deep coma. Ha! <laughs> Welcome, hunter, the strange man said and chuckled. He hung the hatchet on his belt. 
Every move he made sounded with jingling, tools bumping against tools, bumping against still other tools. Uh, are you the king? Scarboy wondered. No, the man said laughing. He walked close and lifted the heavy child from Scarboy's arms. I'm one of the king's men. I'm caretaker, and you are hero. Welcome to Great Park. That's not my name, the boy protested. His empty hand moved by habit to cover his scar. The man chuckled again. That's more your name than you know. Then he turned and walked down the path. Scarboy watched him. Every now and then, caretaker took a little hop. When he did, every inch of him jingled and chimed. The boy was astonished at this silly creature. A king's man, he thought. His wonder increased. Caretaker stopped and looked back at him. Come, he called. We will go to mercy. Scarboy watched the man dance down the path. Then he noticed that full day had come. The boy looked around at the trees and bushes and glorious spreads of green grass, all growing things. He took a deep breath and filled his lungs with cool air. Hero? He would wait and see if such a name were his. A king's man? But where, then, was the king? He would keep watch for a king. After all, Seeing is believing, as the enchanter had said. One thing he did know. His mother had been right. It was not dark in this place where trees grew. There was hardly any darkness at all. The boy hurried to follow after caretaker, feeling in his heart as though he had discovered something he had been hunting after all of his life. And so the boy escaped from the perilous, enchanted city, because he was a hunter at heart, and hunters always find more than they know.